going to be tackling Matthew chapter 11 this morning. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, if you want to open up there. What we're going to be talking about is when faith is hard and the burden is heavy. And kind of the root question that we're looking at today, that this passage, uh, this chapter deals with, is whether you've ever had doubts about God. You know, probably most of us, I would assume probably all of us at some point, have had doubts about God. Whether it's after you've become a Christian or before, there have probably been times when you've wondered whether or not all of this is real. I've been there. Uh, you know, I've been on that journey of questioning, you know, is God real? If God is real, is it the God that I see described in the Bible or is it a different God? So have you ever had doubts about God? That's the question that we're kind of dealing with this morning. We're going to dig into that and see uh, a very central character in Scripture that has this very same doubt and what that means for him, what that means for us today. But I want to start off by looking at a few quotes from uh, well-known pastors of either today or of years past. And first, from uh, though from Alistair McGrath. He says that doubt is natural within faith. It comes because of our human weakness and frailty. Then he contrasts unbelief uh, versus faith or versus doubt. He says, it comes because of our human weakness and frailty, but unbelief is a decision to live your life as if there is no God. It is a deliberate decision to reject Jesus Christ and all that he stands for. But doubt is something quite different. Doubt arises within the context of faith. It is a wistful longing to be sure of the things in which we trust. John MacArthur has said that when the New Testament talks about doubt, whether you're talking about the Gospels or the Epistles, it primarily focuses on believers. That's very important. It's as if you have to believe something before you can doubt it. You have to be committed to it before you begin to question it. So doubt is held up as the unique problem of the believer. And finally, one of my favorites of all time, Charles Spurgeon, said that some of us who have preached the word for years and have been the means of working faith in others and of establishing them in the knowledge of the fundamental doctrines of the Bible have nevertheless been the subjects of the most fearful and violent doubts as to the truth of the very gospel we have preached. So I think the reality that's being displayed here, the reality that we're going to look at this morning, that even for those who seem to be most faithful, faith can at times be hard. Particularly when the burdens of life, the circumstances, the issues of life are particularly heavy. It can become very difficult to have faith. And the good news today, this isn't going to be a complete downer. The good news is that in our doubts, God will meet us where we're at. We're told that seek and you will find. You know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and God will reveal himself to you. So that's the good news we're going to get to today. But in working through this, we're going to look at four portraits of Jesus that we see established in Matthew chapter 11. The first is that, as we've looked at numerous times uh, throughout this study in Matthew, is that Jesus is the promised Messiah. That's the first portrait that we see painted in Matthew 11. So we're going to start by reading the first six verses and then pause. So Matthew 11.1 1 says that when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard, and this is John the Baptist, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. 
and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So this is a, an interesting passage that we come to today. So we, as we saw back in Matthew chapter 4 a while ago, John the Baptist is, of course, in prison at this point. And the question that he has is, you know, what's happening with Jesus? You know, what's going on? We see that's in verse 3. He asked the question, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? So John here, John the Baptist, is doubting Jesus. John, who we'll see in a few moments, we've seen before, and, we'll, and Jesus will say it again in a moment here. John is the greatest prophet. You know, the greatest prophet, you think of all the prophets throughout the Old Testament, John is the greatest prophet. Jesus even calls him the greatest man the greatest man born of woman, so the greatest man ever before him. So the greatest man, literally to this point in human history, is doubting Jesus. He's doubting whether he was the one, you know, again, John's the one coming there, announcing, preparing the way for Jesus. Now he's doubting whether he was actually the one that he was announcing, preparing the way for. So what he's saying is, are you really the Messiah, or should I be looking for someone else to come after you? Did I announce the wrong person? So the question is then, why does John doubt at this point? So I want to look at kind of the anatomy of doubt. Three things that kind of come about as we doubt something. The first is that he's in a difficult situation. You know, he's in prison. You know, he had been proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He had been preparing the way for Jesus. And as a result, as we talked about last week, he was persecuted for that. He's in prison now because of the work that he did, because of the gospel that he proclaimed. So that's the first thing. He's doubting because he's in a difficult situa situation. The second, for, uh, probably even more importantly for John, is there's unmet expectations. He had a certain picture of what the Messiah was going to look like, what the Messiah was going to do. Because it had been prophesied that he will proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Particularly that opening of the prison to those who are bound, that's a prophecy of the Messiah. Here's John in prison and wondering, why am I still in prison? Isn't this prophesied that I would be released? So that's certainly adding to his doubt. And the expectation is not just of John, but of all of the Jewish people, is that Jesus would come, the Messiah would come, he would bring judgment, and he would ultimately overthrow the Roman rule. That was probably the biggest thing they were looking for. They were looking for this David-like king who was going to come and with power and might going to overthrow the government, going to establish his own government on earth. And John's looking at this from a distance in prison, thing, seeing, well, everything kind of looks the same from what I'm hearing. Um, so is this the Messiah that I had been proclaiming? So that's the second thing. We have difficult situations, unmet expectations, and the third thing is limited perception. John didn't, at this point, understand everything that was happening or everything that was not happening around him. He didn't see the full picture at this point. So because of his limited perception he began to doubt. And if we look at that for ourselves, I think that we can probably say very similar things, that when challenges arise, when we have circumstances, different, just could be tragedy, whatever the case might be, that's often the time when doubt starts to build up in us. Well, those same things that happened to John, we can uh, look at that in, in, in a very comparative way sometimes in our own lives. And Ultimately, John didn't know what God was up to. Again, his perspective was very small. You know, like ours is oftentimes, his perspective was very small on what Jesus was actually doing. So the answer to this doubt that we're going to see today is twofold. There's two things in particular. The first is through biblical revelation. Because Jesus answered them, as we saw here, go and tell John what you hear and see. So then he uses phrases taken from Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 uh, and other prophecies of the, of the Messiah to begin to prove who he is. So he's using biblical revelation to deal with doubt. 
He's showing here that blind receive their sight, that the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. You know, this is something that you take, for instance, the blind receiving their sight. That's something that had never happened in all the Old Testament until now. Didn't happen in the Old Testament. Didn't happen after, aside from Paul, it never happened after Jesus. It only happened at that time. But the other thing that these passages in Isaiah that Jesus is quoting from refer to, if you read on, it's referring to judgment. So it's as if Jesus is saying to John, this message that he's sending to John, that that judgment that you're expecting, it's coming. Maybe not in the way or in the timing you expect it, but it is coming. You know, basically, he's saying, trust that Jesus is going to bring that full and final judgment that you're expecting. Maybe, again, not in the way and, and overthrowing the, the Roman rule in that time, um, but he's reassuring John that he hasn't been thrown in prison for nothing, essentially. So that's the first anecdote today, is that, that biblical revelation, the word of God, is meant to alleviate our doubts. The second thing, though, is joyful submission. Because Jesus ends this section by saying, blessed is the one who's not offended by me, or basically the one who trusts in me. So regardless of circumstances that we find ourselves in, regardless of the circumstance that John found himself in, based on biblical revelation and based on trust in Jesus, you'll be blessed. So there's this joyful submission. It's not something that only results in persecution. There's going to be an end that is positive for us. So then we see John's disciples, uh, they leave to take the message back to him. And Jesus begins to talk about John, uh, starting in verse 7. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. So at this point, leading up to this passage, there could be some concern that maybe there's some tension developing between John and Jesus. John is expressing doubt. Maybe there's tension there. But Jesus very quickly eliminates the thoughts of any potential tension between them. He builds John up. So Jesus is defending him. He's affirming John, by, again, by calling John the greatest prophet, you know, the greatest person ever born. You know, if you think back through the history of the Old Testament, you've got Abraham, you've got Moses, you've got Elijah, whom John is compared to, you've got King David. You've got some pretty substantial characters throughout all of the Old Testament. And Jesus is saying that John the Baptist is greater than all of them. You know, that's not light praise. That's pretty substantial uh, language being used there. But it's not just about John's person that is so impressive. It's not just because of who he is that makes him the greatest prophet, the greatest man in history. It's the position that he holds in redemptive history. Because he is the one, we, all throughout the Old Testament, there's this promised prophet 
who would announce the Messiah. You know, that's been for centuries and centuries. We see there's a prophet promised. He's going to come. He's going to announce the Messiah. And so we have John coming on the scene. Basically is the climax of all pre-Christian revelation. He's the one with the honored position of actually announcing, actually preparing the way for Jesus. So that's certainly part of why he's the greatest prophet, why he's the greatest man. It's not all to do with him, but a lot to do with who he's announcing, who he's preparing the way for. And so all of this sets the stage for the next statement, which is really quite astounding, because we see in the second half of verse 11, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now that, that can be a difficult statement. That could be hard to grasp. Like, what does that mean? So the least in the kingdom is greater than the greatest man in human history leading up to Jesus. The reality is, though, and we see this as a perfect example with John, is that those leading up to Jesus, John himself included, have an incomplete picture. You know, before Jesus comes, before Jesus does the work that he is yet to do in, in the studies in Matthew, they didn't know who Jesus was. They had a very incomplete picture of the work he was going to do. So that is true of those who come before Jesus. But those who come after Jesus have a much greater understanding of Christ. You know, there are a lot of, we could dig into this, there are so many different opinions and, and beliefs and doctrines on what this means. We're not going to get into all of that. What I want to get into is that we, in our position in redemptive history, are in a very elevated position of knowing the work that Jesus has done and being able to proclaim that to the nations. We know far more than John the Baptist ever knew, than King David knew, than Abraham, than Moses, than any of them ever knew. That is a position that we hold today. And that's part of why Jesus is able to say that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist, because we get the full picture that he didn't understand at that point. But the reality is that even though we have that knowledge, we, we're in that position, as we saw last week, it's not going to be easy. You know, just like Jesus doesn't have it easy. We're going to see that more in coming weeks, that Jesus has a lot of persecution to undergo. And as we see John the Baptist, he's already not having it very easy being in prison. You know, so if they're being opposed by the world, if they're under persecution, the same will be true of us. You know, we will be opposed by the world as we bring forth this message of Jesus. So that takes us to verse 12, that from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. So we have the kingdom of heaven as it advances, as we bring this message to the world, to Halifax, we will experience opposition. John the Baptist experienced opposition. Jesus experienced opposition. We as well will experience opposition opposition. You know, we saw that again last week as well. We will experience opposition as we bring forth this message. So the, the privilege that we experience in, in understanding, getting this full picture, that privilege of being able to proclaim that gospel comes with a price. That price is persecution. You know, we saw that it's what John the Baptist is dealing with right now in this passage. It's what Jesus is dealing with. We will deal with the same thing. And we won't look at it, but as you get into verses 16 to 19, which you read a moment ago, it's basically summarizing that we'll, we will be criticized in the world. Because we see that John, the picture there is that John barely eats, and he's called demonic. Jesus eats and drinks a lot, so he's called a glutton and a drunkard. You know, John is preaching a message, a hard message of repentance. Jesus, comparatively, some would say, is an easier message of forgiveness. In a lot of ways, they're complete opposites in some of the things that they do, some of the things that they say, and yet the world still found a way to criticize each end of the spectrum. So no matter what you do, no matter what you say, people will always find a way to criticize you. They'll always find some fault in it because this message is offensive to people. You know, I've heard it say a lot, the cross is offensive. 
because it says a lot of things that we don't want to recognize about ourselves, a lot of things that we don't want to acknowledge about ourselves. So the cross will offend people. There's no two ways about that. So if that's the message we're pro proclaiming, we can expect that kind of opposition. And the message then in the reality of doubt is that, that we need to fight that in the midst of difficulty because difficulty will arise, persecution will arise, but we're seeing here that we need to have faith in the promised Messiah. That is the message that John or that Jesus gives to John, and that's the same message for us today. So Jesus is the promised Messiah. He's also the authoritative judge. That's what we see as we continue reading on, starting in verse 20. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. It's pretty strong language again there. When we read that word, woe to, or that, that phrase, woe to you, the literal meaning is essentially a warning of doom upon you. Now, there is basically, there is a bad end in sight for you. Jesus here is speaking to the Galilean cities where he had been performing his miracles. So the reason for woe, the reason for this message is that they didn't repent. And what we should take from this is that Jesus is going to condemn the unrepentant. Because these people had actually gotten to see the Messiah. They had seen the king. They had been amazed by the king. They had even admired him, but they didn't turn from their sin in response to a summons to repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The reference to uh, Tyre and Sidon, these were Gentile cities uh, on the Mediterranean Sea. And they were known for their idolatry, for their immorality. God destroyed them back in Ezekiel 28. And Jesus is saying that if I had done there what I did here, they would have repented. They would have recognized their sin. They would have turned from it. They would have repented of it. He says the same thing about those in Capernaum with even stronger language that Jesus did even did more of his miracles in Capernaum than anywhere else. You know, they had seen firsthand him giving sight to the blind. They had seen firsthand him casting out demons of healing paralytics, of even bringing the dead to life. You know, they had seen all of these things and did nothing in response. So Jesus is saying that's worse than the immorality of Sodom. Saying that Sodom's going to have it better than the day of judgment. You know, we look at what Jesus did, what God did to Sodom back in the Old Testament. It didn't end well for them. He's saying it's going to end worse for you if you don't repent. So Jesus is very clearly establishing himself as the authoritative judge. It's a warning to us to not be unrepentant, to not be indifferent towards sin. So he's the promised Messiah. He's the authoritative judge. He's also the sovereign son. We see this starting in verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things that have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So the message here, Jesus alone knows the Father. The word knows it has a deeper meaning than sometimes that we would perhaps associate to it. You know, I could say, you know, I know Shannon. I know him for a little bit of time now. 
But in reality, I don't know a whole lot about him. You know, I don't know his birthday. I don't know his upbringing. I don't know uh, a whole list of things about Shannon. I hope to get to know a lot of those things. Or I could say, yeah, I, someone could ask, do you know Justin Trudeau? Well, I know who he is. I have not met him, but I know him. I know who he is. No, that's not the use of the word here. This is a very intimate knowledge being referenced. The mo it's the most intimate, the most full knowledge that you could have. That's the implication of the word know here. Basically, this is connecting the deity of the Son. That's the purpose of this, showing that God the Father, God the Son are one. They are both God. It says that he alone then reveals the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son, and to anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So Jesus is the word of God made flesh, revealed to man. And we can know God through the revelation of the Son, not through wisdom and understanding of the world, as we saw in verse uh, 26, I believe. So it's by revelation, not by wisdom, not by human knowledge and human study. It's all ultimately by divine grace. It says, the Father has hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children, for such was his gracious will. So God reveals himself to us. You know, again, we're told, seek and you will find. You know, seek after God, seek after his kingdom, seek after his righteousness first. He will reveal himself to you. You're not going to find him on your own, but if that is your heart's desire, he will reveal himself. And when he does reveal himself, we're to respond not with indifference, not with unrepentance, but we respond in human faith, right? Not in self-righteous religion, as the Pharisees do, not with prideful intellect, as we maybe often want to do, but it's in the humble trust of a child. That's the, the picture used here. A child that acknowledges total dependence on the father. That's the type of faith that we're to respond in. And that leads us to the last point, that Jesus is the gracious master. See this in verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So I want to handle this passage appropriately. I mean, this is probably the most uh, impactful. The, 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 as far as our study through Matthew, this is probably the best thing that we've read so far, the best message that we've seen so far. And yet it's one that I've seen taken and twisted in a way that is unhealthy, as you can do with any scripture. You can always take scripture and use it for your own devices. I've seen this taken a lot. Take the message of, of rest, find rest for your souls, and it leads to a very inactive, very lazy Christian. That's not the message here. But I want to try to explain best as I can what this passage is saying, and in essence, give an explanation of Christianity that is radically different than every other religious system in the history of the world. Because the first thing we see is come to me. You know, what does it mean to come to Jesus? And I believe literally what that means is we give when we come to Jesus, we give all we have to him. All right, so the imagery here is of a yoke. So a yoke is a, a wooden bar that's put on the neck of an animal, typically it's on the neck of an ox, so that the ox could pull along a, a cart. So you have this yoke, this wooden bar that's put on the, the neck of an ox. Typically it's shared between two oxen. Right? And usually, 
In that case, as this yoke is shared, there's usually one ox that is much stronger than the other ox. So you have one that is, uh, that is stronger, that's more experienced, that's more um, schooled in the commands of the master. And this ox would guide the other according to the master's commands. All right, so by coming into a yoke with the strong ox, the weaker ox could learn to obey the master's voice so they could one day be strong as well. So here we have Jesus speaking to self-righteous people, right? people that had been burdened down by laws and rules and regulations and the commandments. You know, some of these coming from God in the Old Testament, some of them coming from the Pharisees as they add it to those laws and began to just create this heavier weight upon people, they began laying burdens on people's shoulders. So that's why it says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. So as we explain what Christianity is, we're giving him the full weight of all our sins. You know, they are burdened, these people are burdened because they failed over and over again to keep the law. And then the religious leaders poured on even more laws. So the weight of sin kept becoming heavier and heavier. And Jesus is coming here saying, give me the weight of all your sin. Not just some of it, but give me all of it. But the weight of sin isn't the whole picture. You know, that's not all that this passage is telling to us. We're also giving him our complete and utter inability to obey God. Because the commands of God can't be carried out by sinful men. It's not possible. It's not in our nature. The call to come to Christ is not a call to reform your life to be a better person or to make yourself a better person. That's not what the call to come to Christ is. The call that Jesus is saying is, come to me, give all that you are to me, yield to me, submit to me, and come into yoke with me, and I'm going to give you all that I have. I'm going to teach you how to become strong. So we give all we have to Jesus. He gives all he has to us. So we say, take my yoke upon you. Jesus, of course, is the stronger one in this picture. He is the, you know, the stronger ox, so to speak. He's able to bear the weight of the Father's commands. So that's why he says, come into yoke with me. We give him all, all we have to him. He gives up all he has to us. We give him the full weight of all our sin, and he gives us full pardon for all of our sin. That's the picture here. You know, enter into yoke with Christ, and you, in all of your sin, before you're a perfect person, before you're trying to make yourself a better person, in all your sin, you are counted righteous in Christ. That's what we've talked about in the past with imputed righteousness. It says, so come to him, and Jesus says, I will give you rest. Literally saying, saying, I'll give you relief from bearing the load that you've been bearing your entire life through all the Old Testament. I'm going to give you relief from that. I'm going to give you freedom from the constant struggle to overcome your own sin, constant struggle, uh, the constant struggle to earn your own salvation, essentially. So we look at the Old Testament, the picture there was this constant need for sacrifices, the constant need to bring offerings before God to become right with God. There was hard work to maintain a right standing with God. Jesus is saying, I'm taking that burden from you. And that in and of itself is good news. That in and of itself is great news, but that's not where Christianity stops. That's not where this message, where this passage stops. Because Jesus not only gives us full pardon for all of our sin, he also gives us his complete ability to obey God. 
It's not all about Jesus being the stronger oxen, us being the weaker oxen, and us never becoming strong. The picture is that he is building us up to be strong as well. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. The word learn, the word translated learn here is the same word in the Great Commission later on in Matthew that is translated disciple. Right, so Jesus is quite literally saying, learn what it means to be my disciple and you'll find rest for your souls. Right, don't learn what it means to be drugged along by me and let me do all the work and you just kind of stay where you're at and never grow, never learn. Saying, no, come into my yoke, learn from me, become my disciple, learn what it means to be my disciple and you will find rest for your soul. And the question of why? Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what does that mean? You know, what does that mean for us today? It means that Jesus, as we saw already, Jesus alone knows the Father. Jesus alone reveals the Father. And Jesus alone perfectly obeys the Father. So as we come into yoke with him, as this passage says, he will lead you in how to walk with the Father. So what it means to be his disciple is to learn how to walk with the Father as Jesus does. So basically, Jesus is saying, come to me, and I will enable you to do what you could never do on your own, what you could never learn to do in your own strength. So in everything that we do, Christ is leading us, he's guiding us, he's enabling us, he's teaching us in those things. It is all Christ being the leader in that. So for us today as a church, it's not about then what we do for the kingdom in our own effort. Very easy to, to look at things and say, okay, this is what we want to accomplish. Let's go out and do it. It's not saying that we shouldn't be active. It's saying that we're not going to do it in our own strength. We're not going to do it based on our own ideas, our own ideals, apart from the will of God, apart from the leading of God. It's to be done in yoke with Jesus. That's what we take from this passage. It's to be done in yoke with him, him leading, him guiding, him building us up. Because the one who calls us to righteous living is the one who lives righteously through us. The one, who, the one who beckons you to trust the Father is the one who enables you to trust the Father. The invitation of Christ, you know, as we saw to start today, you know, when faith is hard, when the burden is heavy, the invitation and the response is to repent of sin. You know, not to be unrepentant, not to be indifferent towards it, but first to repent of sin. Next to renounce yourself. Now the picture we saw today was to come to the Father like a child. You know, be fully dependent like a child is fully dependent on their parents, on their father. We are to be fully dependent on God for all that we do. You know, if you put that weak ox in the yoke, or two weak oxes in the yoke, they're not going to know how to obey the master's command. They won't be strong enough to pull the weight that is there. But as we come into yoke with Christ, he builds us up. That's what it means, to, and again, to look to him as a father, to learn from him, to be fully dependent on him, and to trust that he will do that in our lives. And as a result of that, we can have rest in Christ and find rest for our souls.